everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to this special five-part episode on assessing ethics and compliance in mergers and acquisition. This podcast series is sponsored by Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent, integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on managers ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 700 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance programs, visit our podcast series sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. In part one, we take a look at the whys, what's, and how's of an independent assessment in the M&A context. In part two, the impact M&A has on both the merged company and the parent. In part three, the need for an integration plan to be implemented. And in part four, oversight of merged companies, issues, and complications. Finally, in part five, we conclude with how mergers and acquisitions can benefit from an independent assessment. I know you will enjoy this five-part series and you will get quite a lot out of it. In this fifth and final part of our five-part series, I take a look at how mergers and acquisitions can benefit from an independent assessment. I am joined for this final part of this five-part series by Don Stern. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again for our final episode in our five-part exploration on assessing ethics and compliance in the M&A context. Today, I have back with me Don Stern. Don's the Managing Director of Corporate Monitoring and Consulting at Affiliated Monitors. And today, we're going to pick up on, an, I think, an incredibly important topic that Don articulated on an earlier episode, and that is how M&A can benefit from independent assessment. So, Don, thanking, thank you for taking the time to visit with me again. You're welcome, Tom. Glad to be here. So, uh, you, as I said, you uh, really started this conversation off on an earlier episode, and I thought it was so important. I, I, I appreciate that you can take the time to visit with me a little bit more. But I wanted to start with, at what point in the M&A process would it be helpful for a company to arrange for an independent third-party assessment of uh, the targets, uh, now part of your company, subsidiary or other business units, uh, compliance and ethics program? Well, I, I think it's, I guess I would say as early as is practicable. Uh, you know, at some point, the acquiring company begins to, you know, think about an acquisition. There may be some preliminary discussions, sometimes at the CEO level, sometimes at the C- CFO level. Um, and so it, it, at the, that point, teams are assembled on both sides. That, that There might be a, um, a due diligence room where documents are made available for the acquiring company to review under a non-disclosure agreement. There could be team meetings where teams from one company meet with teams from the other company. And, you know, what I've seen is that sometimes during that process, um, I'll call them ethical or compliance issues pop up towards the end because the companies are not really focused on it. The company that's about to be acquired or merged is certainly not volunteering those issues. And the acquiring company isn't really asking the right questions and looking. And I can remember one example where we got involved, but frankly, it was very, very late in the day. It was, it was, you know, uh, the M and A process is always to some extent a fire drill. You know, everyone's working very hard, compressed time schedules, trying to do a lot in a very short period of time. But an issue had popped up, and we were brought in to take a look at it. But frankly, the the train had left the station. Everyone was geared up to to do the deal, and it, it was not something that probably would have stopped the deal in any event, but it probably would have altered or could have altered the terms of the deal if, if the, the facts which later were uncovered were really known prior to the acquisition. Let me give you an, an example of that. There are certainly instances where when an issue uh, is apparent based upon a, a due diligence pre-merger, that the companies will have to negotiate, for example, a set aside where a certain amount of money might be put in escrow to anticipate the possibility um, of the of that that there might be some enforcement action. 
There might be some self-reporting at that stage to a government agency. Uh, there could, it could make a difference in terms of what the management structure looks like down the road in terms of the, the, the merge company, because it could be that, and I'm just using this by way of hypothetical, the national sales manager might not be the right person for the job based upon a due diligence, which takes a look at um, certain practices of the sales organization, which he or she was in charge of. So to return to your question, I would say as soon as possible to be part of the team, they're going to be accountants, investment bankers, lawyers, IT personnel, sales personnel, and ethics and compliance has got to be at the table. It's got to be part of that process, part of that uh, team asking the right questions and doing the follow-up and doing the due diligence. And having that being done really by a third-party independent um, is, is, I think, helpful because we're not really um, – our job is to independently and faithfully report back what we've found. We're not, we don't have any stock options. We don't have any – bonus that we're going to get once the acquisition takes place. We are truly independent. I think that's something that uh, most M&A specialists really don't consider, which is what you just articulated, the independent nature of the review. Uh, but I wanted to ask, uh, in your experience, in addition to helping the acquiring company, does the independent nature of your review uh, help you actually garner more information from the target or even after the deal is closed from the new new business unit or subsidiary? I, I would say yes. I mean, I think everyone, certainly pre-acquisition, everyone has their, uh, their guard up and they're a little wary about anybody coming in and asking a question, but they have an obligation to, to be truthful and honest. And, and if they're not, and, and if representations are made uh, either to, to us or to or directly to the acquiring company, uh, everyone knows they run the risk of, of litigation down the road. But, you know, we, we have found, and, I, and I've done this, by the way, just by way of contrast, Tom, I've done this in my role as a, as my, my old role as a lawyer uh, involved in some of these deals, and now as a truly independent third-party compliance professional and, 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 and uh, with taking a look at the assessment. And, I, and I, there is a difference. I, I find that people open up uh, more, uh, they're uh, more willing to be forthcoming when somebody outside either company comes in and is asking the questions, really in, in kind of a non-threatening way. Uh, we're just looking for the facts and we're looking for to provide some help uh, for the, the, the new entity uh, if, it, if the acquisition goes through. So the short answer to your question is yes, there's a difference. And I find that we are able to get more information than I think we would otherwise get if we were not independent. Don, I wanted to ask if you could provide some uh, specific examples where an independent assessment may have actually helped mitigate ethical problems deriving from merger and acquisition further down the road. Well, I think, you know, the, I alluded to one earlier in, the, in, in this segment, and, and that is where there was the hint of, a, of an ethics and compliance program, a corruption issue, but there was really inadequate time to, to fully get, uh, for anybody to get their arms around it. And if, if, if there had been more time, if, if we and others had focused on these issues earlier in the process, I think it would have uh, both helped uh, define the terms of the deal, but also helped with the, with the integration process. But uh, e even more broadly, even when there is no specific issue, the more that the acquiring company understands about the culture, about the problems, the issues that it faces, the better it, it, can, it can do it. Uh, I mean, the, the classic example, to some respect, is in the IT area. So the IT professionals get together, and they, they talk about integrating their computer systems and integrating their IT professionals. And so they know on day one, here's the plan. You know, the deal is going to be, you know, inked on January 1st, and here's the plan for the next 30 days as to how we're going to integrate our IT programs, you know, between company A and company B. There is rarely the equivalent plan uh, when it comes to compliance, ethics, and certainly integrating the cultures. And I would suggest that if you had such a plan, you can avoid some of those problems because people would expect, they know that we're going to do the training in, in week three, and we're going to be doing the focus groups in week four, and we're going to be going out to the branch office in Toledo in week five. 
And then we're going to India and talk to the, 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 the senior people in India. So if there's a specific plan, an integration plan, which is, uh, is, is, is carried out, uh, that will, I think, mitigate a lot of the problems. And of course, the one thing we haven't talked about, there may come a point at which uh, the, the and, 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 and Rod Grandin alluded to this in, in one of the earlier segments, that maybe even with good due diligence, pre-acquisition, you may not identify all the problems. And really, when you bear down post-acquisition, those problems might arise. And then there's a question about what do you do? Obviously, you want to remediate as promptly and as effectively as possible. But there may be a question of reporting to the Department of Justice or to other regulatory or enforcement agencies. And and, and as you know, Tom, one of the um, – earlier in, in, in August, so about a, uh, three or four weeks ago, the Department of Justice made clear – that their FCC, FCPA policies for reporting and giving, um, if you will, major credit to companies that self-report FCP violations was explicitly made to be covered in the mergers and acquisition uh, space. And the department was very candid. They said that they're looking to incentivize acquirers to conduct post-closing due diligence and report any significant problems to the Department of Justice. And if they report, if the companies report, it would essentially create a presumption uh, that there would be a declination for prosecution. So there are huge potential benefits in having an effective, thorough, uh, and, and fulsome post-merger due diligence process. And, and I think as part of that, the Department of Justice, uh, and I think good practice suggests that at least some of that be done by a third party independent because you're going to get the best information. You know, it's a great point uh, for us to end on, Don, that uh, uh, the what used what we used to call safe harbor has actually been memorialized now by uh, Justice Department officials uh, as a part of uh, the FCPA corporate enforcement policy and uh, making it a presumption of a declination if you take these steps in uh, the mergers and acquisition context. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. And unfortunately, we're in the end of our time. Uh, time today, but I've been visiting with Don Stern. Don, thank you for taking the time, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Same here, Tom. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you've enjoyed this special five-part exploration of assessing ethics and compliance in the mergers and acquisition context. If you'd like any more information from Affiliated Monitors, you can contact them through their website, affiliatedmonitors.com. Affiliated Monitors, of course, was the sponsor of this podcast series. I look forward to bringing you another series, and I hope you will join me again on another podcast from the Compliance Podcast Network.